We've got a great webinar for you all today. As always, uh, every Wednesday, we come to you live, mounting outdoor access points today with Jack Clifford, our customer support engineer, uh, new to the team here. Um, love having him on board. He came to us from Nike. Of course, we've got Heather Dremel with us today, our digital marketing manager, and we've got Mr. Jim Vada, CWNE 183, and our chief wireless officer. So, uh, Heather, if you don't mind passing the controls over to Jack, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And I think he's going to start with a little background on himself and, and get us all uh, energized. All right, Zach, sure? you got your slides. Looks good. All right. So about me, uh, like Don said, I'm fairly new to 7Signal. I think I've been here for almost two months now. Um, I have my CWNA, my CWDP, my CWAP. I'm missing the CWSP uh, to work on that, getting that CWNE certification. My background is mostly just a typical network engineer, um, heavily involved with route switch side of things, and I've mostly dabbled in the Wi-Fi front. I've kind of moved more into a Wi-Fi focus the past two years of my career, I guess. Um, experience in multiple different environments, uh, started in the energy sector, uh, mining companies, power companies, the likes of that, healthcare providers, hospitals, university hospitals, uh, clinics, those kind of things. And then moved, like Don said, to, to Nike. So supporting retail environments, uh, very high density office deployments. So I've seen quite a few different uh, Wi-Fi installs. So a quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, when you're designing for an outdoor Wi-Fi network, there are some kind of unique requirements that's a little different than that of like a typical indoor uh, enterprise design. Uh, you have a harder time connecting to like the wired network, for example, to provide a backhaul to your APs. Because um, even though it is wireless, you still have to have some type of wired connection to get everything to work. Um, yeah, so we'll briefly talk a little bit about point-to-point -point networks, some point-to-multi-point networks, some different common outdoor specific um, wireless networks. So think like point-to-point -point bridging or point-to-multi-point -point bridging as well as like mesh networks, I think that's probably the most common that people think of whenever they think of outdoor. Uh, there's lots of issues that are unique as well to wi wireless outside. Uh, and a lot of them can lead to kind of a suboptimal performance for the client. Uh, but you can avoid some of those issues just by following some best practices. So some of those issues can be unwanted disconnects for the client, a lot of retries, poor throughput, that kind of thing. We'll talk a little bit about the, the best practices of actually installing your APs. So how to kind of prevent mother nature from causing downtime or causing issues for the client. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with some uh, Q&A. So. Uh, probably the biggest ch challenge when it comes to outdoor Wi-Fi is just that the environment can literally change every day. And specifically, it can change drastically with the changes of the seasons, for example. Um, you have very few attenuation sources outside, typically. Um, a lot of times you're trying to cover a very open area. So there's no, there's no predictable walls, for example, outdoors like there is inside. Um, so your cell size of your coverage area might end up being larger than you anticipate. And you can have clients that are farther away from your uh, access point 
and farther away from other clients within that coverage area that can cause what we know is a hidden node problem. They can't really see each other and they try and talk at the same time. So that's where your excessive retries kind of pop their head. Where if you think about like in inside design, you can you can easily shrink your sales of your coverage area by using those attenuation sources to your advantage. So placing APs inside wall, inside rooms, for example, those walls and those doors will help limit how far the signal propagates out. So because the outside Wi-Fi, the, the coverage cells are larger, it also incre uh, introduces some kind of unique security issues that are not typically something you think about with uh, indoor Wi-Fi. For example, it's it can be sometimes hard to physically secure your equipment. If you don't mount your APs at a high enough level, for example, you can have somebody walk up to your access point, unplug it, remove it from the wall, and now you're left with a coverage hole or even worse, you have a exposed ethernet cable and they can plug in a laptop and have access into your network, for example. Uh, it's a It's a good, target for people trying to attack networks, uh, mostly because they don't even really need to be physically near uh, your network to actually do the, the the attacking or the hacking, so to say. They can use some type of like a Yagi antenna or like a high directional or a high gain directional antenna, for example, be kind of farther away from your network, but still able to connect into it. Uh, another thing that's a little unique is a lot of your outdoor, uh, specifically outdoor rated APs, the way they work is they, um, they're they required to have be entered into a uh, MAC filter or a MAC registration table on the actual controller. Um, and if it's literally just the MAC, MAC address kind of registration, that could easily be spoofed. Like you can you can do some scanning to figure out the MAC address of that AP, for example. And like I said, if they're not physically um, secured, you could spoof that same MAC address onto your laptop, for example, and your laptop's now posing as an access point. Uh, we'll go into some things that can be done to kind of limit some of these challenges and, and uh, kind of help alleviate some of these problems as well. And I know, like I said, the, the mesh networks, that's probably what most people uh, think of whenever they think of outdoor Wi-Fi. I know it's become very popular in the residential space as well. Um, mesh is kind of the, the, new, the new thing for home installs, for example. It's, it's very common to provide like a large coverage in an outdoor environment. But there are some issues with mesh. Um, each hop increases the latency that the client um, the client has. It also lowers the bandwidth. So those are things that you need to think about whenever you're designing your network. And the last thing, well, it's not the, last, not the only last thing, but a very important thing is how are you going to power your APs? Uh, a lot of times you don't have a readily available power source in the middle of a field or the, the middle of a parking lot, for example. So your options are limited and, and providing power to those locations can have a high cost associated to them. So some, 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 some tips to overcome some of these challenges, uh, you can statically assign your power levels on your APs. Uh, this will help have a, a predictable coverage cell. Uh, when you lower the power, it will also shrink the, the cell of the, the signal. You also should have some, some intrusion prevention mechanisms kind of in place on your network. It's kind of important, but especially with outdoor Wi-Fi, it can help prevent some of those attacks, like I mentioned, uh, and then have multiple layers of security in place as opposed to just the Mac filtering uh, on the controller. APs can 
come with certificates installed by the vendor, for example, that um, they have to, the controller looks for those certificates on the AP to verify that, yes, that's a, that's a Cisco AP, for example. Another thing you can do is actual 802.1x authentication on the switch port itself. Uh, I know that most of us are probably familiar with 802.1x uh, authentication on the SSID, for example, but you can do it on the switch port to verify that, yes, this is an approved device connected to this specific uh, switch port. So you don't have to worry about um, somebody just kind of coming in and plugging, plugging in, for example. Uh, the most important thing you can do, especially in outdoor, though, is have an actual proper site survey. It's kind of critical. You have unique interferers whenever it comes to an outside environment. So depending on where you're located, um, like water in the atmosphere, for example, can kind of pose some type of issue. Um, if you're in a really humid environment, for example, uh, that, that comes into play. Clouds that roll through, fog, um, like I said, it can change your, your, uh, your environment in a, during the day. Another thing that's really kind of common for outdoor that's specifically unique for outdoor is electrical interference. So if you're installing your, your Wi-Fi network near like power lines or even near like a substation, for example, or a parking lot next to like a train station, you have to think about the, the electrical line that's ran through the railroad track. Um, all of those electrical lines produce interference. Depend and if you're not on site to see those interferes, you don't really know where or how far they actually go. Um, I know our planning tools that we have, I've come a long way and specifically with outside and outdoor um, planning and designing, you can kind of use Google Earth is a good popular tool for that. Uh, you can actually rotate 3D images. You can see elevation changes, uh, but those tools don't necessarily show you like those power lines, for example. So being on site uh, is kind of crucial for the design to be successful. Um, so we can talk about a little bit about different types of specific networks. First one we're gonna talk about is point-to-point -point networks, uh, primarily used to connect two buildings together. Uh, you don't have to worry about um, an expensive per monthly fee paying to a service provider, for example. Um, you can have multiple buildings utilizing the same internet link. Um, that's probably the most common reason to connect buildings together. Um, you, don't, you don't need a wired infrastructure between the buildings. Uh, you can just connect them with a wireless link. Um, yeah, you, you don't have to worry about uh, least line availability. Uh, if you're kind of concerned about security, you will have that wireless link is a private link. It's only your uh, data being sent across that medium. Uh, where if you're using a leased line, it's technically a shared medium with multiple people's data traversing that. Uh, it costs significantly less to install a point-to-point -point link than it does to run, say, five miles of fiber cable significantly less cost. You also don't have to worry about getting the right permits to trench your, your fiber. You don't have to worry about uh, easement restrictions. That Those are things that, that aren't really things you worry about whenever you're just putting a, a device up on a roof in one location and then putting it up on the other roof. It's, it's you're, you're buying the equipment and that's about it. Uh, most of them these days used unlicensed spectrum, so it's totally free to use. You don't have to worry about applying to the FCC to, to uh, be approved to have your own spectrum space. Uh, in these days, the throughput numbers are crazy. You can do up to 10 gigabits over a point-to-point -point wireless link, and the range on them is kind of insane, over 100 kilometers. Uh, I think that's 
roughly 60 miles, I believe. Uh, whenever you have a network that long, though, like the, like the question we talked about earlier, after about seven miles, you have to take into effect that the earth is round and you won't really be able to have that line of sight. So you need repeaters and uh, points in between them to uh, kind of continue the curve of your, your signal. Uh, the photo there is actually uh, a point-to-point -point link at a previous company I worked for um, using a ubiquity air fiber to connect uh, some buildings together. I think the distance was four or five miles between the two of them. Uh, another, another type of network is similar to a point to point. It's point to multi point though. So it's, it's essentially the same thing, but you have a central base station that's now connecting multiple links out. So it, it, that one location will have four, five, six, seven, however many you, you have um, connections back. So it's, it's think of like a traditional, like a star or a uh, hub and spoke type network topology where you, you have a central location and then it branches out from there. You'll see this with a lot of wireless service providers where they have a base station that's at like a higher elevation than their endpoints um, and the clients then connect back and that's their, their backhaul essentially. Um, so the client is typically using a directional antenna facing that base, central base station. Another application that you'll see this a lot is video surveillance systems. So you'll have CCTV cameras installed on light poles, for example, that connect back to a central location via a wireless link. For this uh, insula installation, line of sight is very vital simply because it's multiple links. Um, and one thing to note though, when it comes to, to Wi-Fi and you're thinking of line of sight, for a wireless signal, it's not necessarily just a straight line. It's more of a uh, uh, elliptical cylinder, I guess is the best way to describe it. It's called a Fresnel zone. Uh, it's a, it's like a, yeah, it kind of looks like a long donut or like a baguette, I guess, type of bread, for example, which makes sense. It's named after a French guy. Um, so you, you want to make sure that that Fresnel zone is at least 60% free from uh, obstructions. If, it, if you have more than 40% of it obstructed, you will notice some signal issues. Uh, there's multiple tools out on the internet to calculate uh, your Fresnel zone. So you, it's not something that you have to really think about in terms of doing the math or the physics involved behind it. But it is useful to know that that the the line of sight for Wi-Fi is, is not necessarily just a straight line. It's different from your, how you see things. You can also have a mixed deployment when it comes to uh, to these networks. So you can you can use point to multipoint and then expand off with another point to point link further down the road. Uh, but remember that each link that you introduce, you're also introducing more latency and you're decreasing some throughput. So the most common point to multipoint network, like I said, is probably mesh networks. It's very common for uh, needing to cover very large areas. You have two different types of APs in this environment. You have a root AP and a node AP. The root AP is the one that actually has a wired connection back into your infrastructure. And then the node AP is just the one that uses a wireless link to connect back to a root AP for its backhaul. Um, you want to minimize your hop count. So how many hops it takes for a node AP to get back to the root AP for, um, because each hop will, like I said, increase latency, decrease throughput. You want to maximize the signal between those hops. So you want the signal between your node AP and your root AP, for example. You want it to ideally be in between, in the, like the neg 40 to neg 50 range. 
this isn't really achievable in the real world, but that's that's what people say is to use neg 50 to neg uh, neg 40 to neg 50. I like to make sure that it's at least neg 65 or better to that's kind of a real world application that is, you want it to at least be neg 65 or better between your nodes to have um, optimal client performance. You want to group your APs together. So you, you want um, kind of a cluster of APs. You want your node APs to be surrounding your root APs. And ideally, you only want the node AP to have one hop to get to the root AP. Uh, this will keep latency issues at bay, throughput issues to a minimum. And also, it kind of allows for some uh, failures to occur. So if you have a root node that goes down, um, the nearby node APs will only have an additional, say, two or three hops to get back to a, a different root AP. So kind of like a self-healing network, for example. And you're still not having huge latency issues for those clients connected to those node APs that have uh, that are now having multiple hops. So you also have to think about the fact that you're going to have to run Ethernet and fiber to all of your root APs. Or you could use a point-to-point -point link, for example, and use like a wireless backhaul as like a virtual wireless cable, I guess, something you can think about. Um, again, increases latency, lowers throughput, but it might help in like really uh, rural environments, for example, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, I would only use this if there weren't any other options. To, um, a lot of the times there isn't other options though, so that's why mesh networks are pretty common outdoors. Uh, so yeah, uh, well, again, thing to note is that you increase latency and you lower throughput. That's that's the vital thing to take away with mesh networks is that each hop, you're you're decreasing optimal client performance. So a mesh network will never perform the same as a conventional Wi-Fi network. A client will, will not have the the same performance if when they're connected to a node AP versus a traditional wireless network, for example. Um, some common issues that kind of pop their head, specifically relating to like poorly installed APs. You can have some RF related issues so that they can, your clients can frequently disconnect or they're experiencing some slowness. That may not have, not be because your, your uh, network is poor. It might just be that your APs are physically installed in a bad, bad location. So are they, near metal objects are there is there metal above or next to or right in front of an antenna for example are you too close to metal because metal will reflect the the wireless signal um, you could have like i said clients with high retry rate when if they're too far away from each other um, you, you just have overall slowness there from the high ret retry rate you don't really want to install any AP inside of a metal enclosure, but it just doesn't work. Um, you're basically it's shielding all of your uh, wireless signal within that enclosure. Uh, so, so for example, if you have like an omnidirectional antenna providing like a mesh environment, but on one side of it, there's some type of metal object you've now basically made that omnidirectional antenna into a sector antenna, for example, where you're uh, bouncing that signal off of the metal object and it's reflecting back. Uh, you can also have some other issues. So if you don't properly ground your equipment uh, or you don't physically install it correctly, you can have a total AP failure. Or you can have APs that are still operational, but they just don't work optimally like they once did. Um, so you can have clients that won't be able to connect uh, or they will connect at poor signal strength and you have coverage holes in your environment 
that are because you didn't properly ground them or you didn't properly install your access point. So ways that you can avoid that is kind of following some best practices when it comes to the physical install of outdoor IPs. It's 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 always important and vital to install IPs correctly, but more so outside because you're exposed to different elements than you would indoors. Firstly, you want to make sure you're using proper mounting brackets for not only your IP, but your type of install. If you're installing it on a wall, you want to make sure you're using a wall mount bracket. If you're installing it on a pole, make sure you're um, installing it with a pole mount bracket, for example. You don't want to mix the two up. Um, you also want to check to make sure that if it's IP rated to actually be outside, is it rugged enough to withstand different elements that it's going to be exposed to? If it's not a IP rated, you will need to make sure it's installed in some type of NEMA enclosure. So it's protected from the elements. You also want to make sure that your APs are installed where your clients are going to be. It's the whole point of having Wi-Fi is to serve your clients. Uh, you want to optimally be within line of sight to your clients within your APs as well. Uh, a good general rule for installing uh, is don't install any AP more than 40 feet off the ground. I like to kind of start at a height of 15 feet, and then you can kind of adjust from there. Uh, if you're using an AP just as like a point-to-point -point link or just as a uh, wireless bridge, backhaul for a uh, mesh root AP, for example, since those uh, links are not actually serving clients, they can be installed at a higher, higher uh, level off the ground than say 40 feet. Um, another some useful things to do when thinking about the install. Uh, you want to make sure that your APs are oriented in a way that you can actually see the LEDs from the ground. So you don't have to go climb a ladder or uh, climb a pole to look at some LEDs of your AP to see what's going on with them. Something else you can do is run a console cable already connected to the console port of the AP. That way you don't have to take the whole thing apart to connect to your uh, to your AP via that console cable. Just some things like that to help with the troubleshooting process. Um, some different options for you to actually mount this. Um, there's lots these days. Uh, they make enclosures that attach the walls, for example, or that uh, that bollard there in the ground next to the the fence that's actually an enclosure for an access point you would never realize that it actually had an ap in it but yeah there's an ap inside that, that bollard that's providing coverage to clients they're great specifically because they blend into the environment you don't even have to like no one most people will not realize that hey there might be an ap inside there and it also brings the the signal down to the client level because clients are going to be on the ground. It's it's very important to select your enclosure um, that meets kind of your needs the best. You you want to make sure that it offers you some type of physical protection. And like I said, you don't want somebody coming and just taking your equipment. You don't want someone to come and tamper with your equipment. So you want to be able to, to lock the enclosure in place or uh, prevent someone from even realizing, hey, there might be equipment inside there. Uh, you want to take into to effect, how is it going to protect your equipment from the weather? Is it, are you going to be exposed to, to rain? Are you going to be exposed to snow? Are you going to be exposed to, to ice? What about extreme heats? those kind of things, uh, especially with the heat, you want to make sure that your equipment, you want to check what its am uh, operating ambient temperatures are and realize that when they're installed in an enclosure, the enclosure is going to be a, at a higher temperature than what's outside the enclosure because all of that equipment is producing heat that's then trapped inside the enclosure. 
a thing to think about as well when selecting an enclosure is the solar loading. Um, the color of the enclosure is going to have a big, uh, kind of a, a big thing when it comes to attracting heat from the sun, for example. A black enclosure is going to have less um, heat um, tolerances inside the enclosure because it's going to be attracting more heat. It's where you'll have more of a tolerance with like a white enclosure, for example, because it's reflecting that heat off. Um, another thing is the, just the general aesthetics of the enclosure. Most people don't want to look at some outdoor AP that's kind of an eyesore sitting on side of a wall, where if you have just a white box, people think less of it. So but because of this, uh, the actual install of APs is significantly higher costs when it comes to installing outside than it is in, inside. Uh, you have to think about running power, running cabling, all those things, plus the enclosure, plus protecting it from the elements. All those things add, the, add up for additional costs that you have to worry about. Here's some examples of some NEMA enclosures. Obviously, some of these are metal and you want to avoid those but there's tons of NEMA enclosures. They have some that are vented like the one on the left there or the one on the right that has actual cooling fans that, that uh, help cool the inside of the enclosure for some of those heat related issues. Uh, when it comes outdoors, selecting your antenna is very crucial. It's crucial for any type of uh, wireless install, but it's very crucial for an outdoor environment. Uh, you wanna look at the radiation pattern of the antenna you're selecting, make sure it works for your needs. You have uh, typical antennas that you would see outside are omnidirectional, directional, even uh, sector antennas. So the one, the pattern on the, the left is what uh, uh, a typical omnidirectional antenna looks like. The one on the right is directional and then the one in the middle is a sector install or a sector antenna. You want to avoid obstructions to your antennas. So you don't want your antenna just directly facing a wall, for example, or uh, in the middle of trees. You don't want it near trees or you don't want cables ran uh, in front of your antenna, for example. Anything that's going to obstruct your signal is going to uh, make your client performance that much worse. You want to avoid having metal objects too close to your antenna. You don't want like I said, to, to install it directly next to a giant piece of metal that's gonna change the properties of the actual antenna itself. When it comes to uh, supplying power to your, your AP, that's where it becomes a little trickier outside. Uh, you have, you will always wanna verify with the manufacturer kind of the power requirements of your, your access point. You have different types of power. You can provide it with AC power, or DC power. You can provide it with PoE. The thing to note about PoE is that a lot of the, the PoE injectors are not IP rated. So if you, if you use one of those, you wanna make sure that one, it's either an outdoor rated IP rated power injector. And if it's not, it needs to be inside of an EMA enclosure. Uh, you, you want to look at the operating temperatures of the injector itself. Will it still work in the environment you're deploying to, or will heat, for example, or cold cause it to fail? Um, they make actually make uh, taps, like light pole taps. So if you're installing your AP on a light pole, for example, you can tap into the uh, power that's that's providing the power to the, the light on that light pole. A thing to note about those though, is that a lot of them use a solar eye on them that controls uh, controls the actual power to the light. So in the middle of the day, it actually cuts the power to turn off the light. So when it does that, if you're utilizing that power, your AP is gonna turn off. A thing you can do to avoid that is using a battery bank that's connected, so they, they kind of work hand in hand together. Uh, the, the picture there on the right is actually what one of those uh, bollard enclosures looks like on the inside. So you have like an enclosure at the bottom and then you can actually physically mount your AP and antenna uh, above it. 
thing that's very important, especially outdoors, that is probably very commonly overlooked. I know from my previous installs, it's something that's overlooked. It's making sure you ground your equipment. It's very important. Uh, when your equipment is not properly grounded, uh, excess energy that's in the air or on the equipment can not only be transferred into the equipment that you have installed outside, but it can be transferred to the interior equipment too, the, the switches that you're connected to. Uh, you can cause some outages, some device failures, or just simple poor performance because of improperly grounded equipment. Uh, if your AP is installed on a pole, though, for example, a lot of them do have a ground wire already installed on them, and you can just kind of use that existing ground wire on that pole. But if there isn't one, you do want to make sure you run a new wire directly to the earth from the pole. Uh, properly grounded equipment helps prevent a static buildup in your equipment, um, can cause some issues that are a little odd to locate at first. It's not always just a complete total hardware failure. A lot of the times it, pre it presents itself as like poor transmit power. It's not actually transmitting at the power you think it is, or your AP is now a little less sensitive whenever it comes to the re uh, receive sensitivity. Another thing to note is that grounding your equipment um, you have to worry about corrosion. Excuse me. Uh, mostly because whenever you're uh, grounding your equipment, you're actually using different metals um, to connect each other. So because of that, different metals have different properties and being exposed to moisture as well with the electrical buildup and the fact that those metals have different electrical impedance, for example, um, you can introduce corrosion that will have other issues. It's easily prevented. They have um, anti-corrosion compounds that you can buy um, rated spe for specific types of metals. Uh, one thing that you have to worry about outdoors that you don't really have to worry about inside is protecting against lightning. Um, so you want to ch check with the manufacturer. Um, a lot of outdoor rated APs have some specifically designed <coughs> internal circuitry that protects itself from lightning. Uh, with those APs, if there's an antenna that's directly connected to them, those antennas are also protected by that internal circuitry. Where you have to really worry about it is if you're connecting your antennas via a cable. Those cables can be a source to attract lightning to cause damage to your equipment. So you will want to ground them with a lightning arrestor. Um, lightning arrestors for the most part are required for insurance purposes or even code requirements for your install. Uh, they make little small cables or connectors. You attach the cable to it and then it attaches to your AP and it has grounding points like the photo there on the left. Um, another thing to note is you want to protect not only your outdoor um, AP, the actual physical equipment, you also want to protect your internal equipment inside your building. Um, so they make Ethernet surge protectors like the one on the right there that's um, preventing electrical buildup from entering to your switch via the, the Ethernet cable. And then one kind of important last thing to, to talk about is protecting against water. So anything that's not IP rated, like I said, needs to be inside of an even enclosure. Uh, all the unused ports on your AP, you should make sure you cap them. You want to use metal caps. You don't want to use plastic caps. Those typically fail pretty quickly. You want to make sure that you include all of the uh, rubber gaskets that came with your equipment. It's especially important for your ethernet connection. Um, your ethernet connection, you kind of want to try and get it to where it's running downwards. So gravity can help you from getting water to pull in through your ethernet port. If you can't avoid running it downwards, 
uh, you can do you can install what's called a drip loop into your cable run like there on the right where there's a loop underneath that lets the water fall off the cable before it actually connects to your AP to, to that connection point. So there's less chance of water entering through, through that. Um, you always wanna make sure you're using shielded cables. Uh, they can be shielded for both lightning and moisture. Uh, all of your cable vendors do a pretty good job of providing kind of detailed charts of the different types of shielding and when to use them, when not to use them. Um, like for example, cables that are buried in the ground have different shielding requirements than cables that are actually exposed to the elements. A good thing to use is what's called coax seal. Uh, it's good to use on your connection points itself. Um, it's like a hand moldable plastic tape. You can wrap around your connection and then mold it with your hand to prevent moisture. So yeah, so um, kind of overview, uh, site surveys, like most Wi-Fi installs, that's probably the most important thing. You can avoid your uh, issues beforehand by doing a proper site survey. Another thing to note is that the more complex the network is, the more issues you probably have. The simpler the network, the better. Um, there's always that, that uh, acronym KISS, keep it simple, stupid. You want to make sure that simple networks typically run better. So try and get it as simple as possible, which is typically why I don't like mesh networks. It adds complexity. Uh, always note that wireless links will have an increased latency and lower throughput. The more links you have, the more hops you have, the more latency you'll have, the lower throughput you'll have, the farther down the line you get. Yes, proper installs do cost quite a bit, but they will reduce your client issues down the road. You won't have to worry about issues popping up three, four, five weeks or months or years down the road. Uh, there are some challenges specifically related to outdoor Wi-Fi, but following some best practices, following some of these guidelines can help you overcome some of those challenges. So yeah, I think we'll go to some questions. All right, Jack, great job. And thanks very much. We got some good questions from the audience. We can, uh, I think we've got a few minutes for questions here. Uh, so Patrick, uh, Jack says, um, he wants to know what the best practices are for installing Wi-Fi APs uh, in outdoor public spaces uh, where the only mounting locations are light poles. So you already talked about that a little bit, but any other words of wisdom there for Patrick? Um, I guess best practices, like like I said, you can utilize the, the power that's built into the light pole. You kind of want to make sure that you're avoiding the light itself. You don't want to be directly next to the light. Like I said, electrical interference can come off of that light. You don't want to be like sitting directly on top of the light to where you have to go through the light to get to your clients that are on the ground, you kind of want it to be midway up the pole, for example. All right, cool. Uh, Olivier asks, um, can you recommend a compact solar solution to power a single remote AP? Solar power in the uh, Pacific Northwest or uh, British Columbia, I should say. Uh, I actually, I actually don't know of any off the top of my head. I've I, I've never really used solar power um, to provide power to an AP directly. So don't really have any recommendations for that. Yeah, same here. I've never I never used solar uh, for APs either. Um, so uh, good question here from. Matt Armstrong, I think we'll make this our last question before we transition. Uh, he, Jack, he says, when looking at radiation patterns, how can I determine the estimated effective range, assume, assuming normal client um, receive gain? Uh, you probably wanna use some type of calculator on the internet to figure out what your uh, 
what your attenuation is. You calculate that that uh, that free space path loss, for example, go through the the gain of your antenna the, with the 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 losses from your cabling. So if it's cabled back to, you're going to have a loss from that cable going to the antenna. Uh, the, the the radiation pattern is more just to see what it looks like coming out. The power is more what's determining how far it's going. Yeah, you take all those factors and look for a, a really high quality link budget calculator and plug in all your numbers and you should get a pretty good estimate from that. All right, great. I think that wraps up the Q&A. Uh, nice job, Jack. Thanks a lot.